Rural Life in England by Washington Irving. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Bonhoff. Rural Life in England by Washington Irving. O oh, friendly to the best pursuits of man, friendly to thought, to virtue, and to peace, domestic life in rural pleasures pass. Cowper. The stranger who would form a correct opinion of the English character must not confine his observations to the metropolis. He must go forth into the country. He must sojourn in villages and hamlets. He must visit castles, villas, farmhouses, cottages. He must wander through parks and gardens, along hedges and green lanes. He must loiter about country churches attend wakes and fairs and other rural festivals and cope with the people in all their conditions and all their habits and humours in some countries the large cities absorb the wealth and fashion of the nation they are the only fixed abodes of elegant and intelligent society and the country is inhabited almost entirely by boorish peasantry in england on the contrary the metropolis is a mere gathering place or general rendezvous of the polite classes where they devote a small portion of the year to a hurry of gaiety and dissipation and having indulged this kind of carnival return again to the apparently more congenial habits of rural life the various orders of society are therefore diffused over the whole surface of the kingdom and the more retired neighbourhoods afford specimens of the different ranks the English, in fact, are strongly gifted with a rural feeling. They possess a quick sensibility to the beauties of nature, and a keen relish for the pleasures and employments of the country. This passion seems inherent in them. Even the inhabitants of cities, born and brought up among brick walls and bustling streets, enter with facility into rural habits, and evince a tact for rural occupation the merchant has his snug retreat in the vicinity of the metropolis where he often displays as much pride and zeal in the cultivation of his flower garden and the maturing of his fruits as he does in the conduct of his business and the success of a commercial enterprise even those less fortunate individuals who are doomed to pass their lives in the midst of din and traffic contrive to have something that shall remind them of the green aspect of nature in the most dark and dingy quarters of the city the drawing-room window resembles frequently a bank of flowers every spot capable of vegetation has its grass plot and flower bed and every square its mimic park laid out with picturesque taste and gleaming with refreshing verdure those who see the englishman only in town are apt to form an unfavourable opinion of his social character he is either absorbed in business or distracted by the thousand engagements that dissipate time thought and feeling in this huge metropolis he has therefore too commonly a look of hurry and abstraction wherever he happens to be he is on the point of going somewhere else at the moment he is talking on one subject his mind is wandering to another and while paying a friendly visit he is calculating how he shall economize time so as to pay the other visits allotted to the morning an immense metropolis like london is calculated to make men selfish and uninteresting in their casual and transient meetings they can but deal briefly in commonplaces they present but the cold superficies of character its rich and genial qualities have no time to be warmed into a flow it is in the country that the englishman gives scope to his natural feelings he breaks loose gladly from the cold formalities and negative civilities of town throws off his habits of shy reserve and becomes joyous and free-hearted he manages to collect round him all the conveniences and elegances of polite life and to banish its restraints his country seat abounds in with every requisite either for studious retirement tasteful gratification or rural exercise books paintings music horses dogs and sporting implements of all kinds are at hand he puts no constraint either upon his guests or himself but in the true spirit of hospitality provides the means of enjoyment and leaves everyone to partake according to his inclination 
the taste of the English in the cultivation of land, and in what is called landscape gardening, is unrivaled. They have studied nature intently, and discovered an exquisite sense of her beautiful forms and harmonious combinations. Those charms which in other countries she lavishes in wild solitudes are here assembled round the haunts of domestic life. They seem to have caught her coy and furtive graces, spread them like witchery round their rural abodes. Nothing can be more imposing than the magnificence of English park scenery vast lawns that extend like streets of vivid green where here and there clumps of gigantic trees heaping up rich piles of foliage the solemn pomp of groves and woodland glades with the deer trooping in silent herds across them the hare bounding away to the covert or the pheasant suddenly bursting upon the wing the brook taught to wind in natural meanderings or expanded into a glassy lake the sequestered pool reflecting the quivering trees with the yellow leaf sleeping on its bosom and the trout roaming fearlessly about its limpid waters while some rustic temple or sylvan statue grown green and dank with age gives an air of classic sanctity to the seclusion these are but a few features of park scenery but what most delights me is the creative talent with which the english decorate the unostatious abodes of middle life the rudest habitation, the most unpromising and scanty portion of land, in the hands of an Englishman of taste, becomes a little paradise. With a nicely discriminating eye, he seizes at once upon its capabilities and pictures in his mind the future landscape. The sterile spot grows in loveliness under his hand, and yet the operations of art which produce the effect are scarcely to be perceived. The cherishing and training of some trees the cautious pruning of others the nice distribution of flowers and plants of tender and graceful foliage the introduction of a green slope of velvet turf the partial opening of a peep of blue distance or silver gleam of water all these are managed with a delicate tact a pervading yet quiet assiduity like the magic touchings with which a painter finishes up a favorite picture the residence of people of fortune and refinement in the country has diffused a degree of taste and elegance in rural economy that descends to the lowest class the very laborer with his thatched cottage and narrow slip of ground attends to their embellishment the trim hedge the grass plot before the door the little flower bed bordered with snug box the woodbine trained up against the wall and hanging its blossoms about the lattice the pot of flowers in the window the holly providently planted about the house to cheat winter of its dreariness and to throw in a semblance of green summer to cheer the fireside all these bespeak the influence of taste flowing down from high sources and pervading the lowest levels of the public mind if ever love as poets sing delights to visit a cottage it must be the cottage of an english peasant the fondness for rural life among the higher classes of the english has had a great and salutary effect upon the national character i do not know of a finer race of men than the english gentlemen instead of the softness and effeminacy which characterize the men of rank in most countries they exhibit a union of elegance and strength a robustness of frame and freshness of complexion which I am inclined to attribute to their living so much in the open air and pursuing so eagerly the invigorating recreations of the country. The hardy exercises produce also a healthful tone of mind and spirits, and a manliness and simplicity of manners, which even the follies and dissipations of the town cannot easily pervert and can never entirely destroy. In the country, too, the different orders of society seem to approach more freely to be more disposed to blend and operate favorably upon each other the distinctions between them do not appear to be so marked and impassable as in the cities the manner in which property has been distributed into small estates and farms has established a regular gradation from the noblemen through the classes of gentry small landed proprietors and substantial farmers down to the laboring peasantry and while it has thus banded the extremes of society together it has infused into each intermediate rank a spirit of independence this it must be confessed 
is not so universally the case at present as it was formerly the larger estates having in late years of distress absorbed the smaller and in some parts of the country almost annihilated the sturdy race of small farmers these however i believe are but casual breaks in the general system i have mentioned in rural occupation there is nothing mean in debasing it leads a man forth among scenes of natural grandeur and beauty it leaves him to the workings of his own mind operated upon by the purest and most elevating of external influences such a man may be simple and rough but he cannot be vulgar the man of refinement therefore finds nothing revolting in an intercourse with the lower orders in rural life as he does when he casually mingles with the lower orders of cities he lays aside his distance and reserve and is glad to waive the distinctions of rank and to enter into the honest heartfelt enjoyments of common life indeed the very amusements of the country bring men more and more together and the sound hound and horn blend all feelings into harmony i believe this is one great reason why the nobility and gentry are more popular among the inferior orders in england than they are in any other country and why the latter have endured so many excessive pressures and extremities without repining more generally at the unequal distribution of fortune and privilege to this mingling of cultivated and rustic society may also be attributed the rural feeling that runs through british literature the frequent use of illustrations from rural life those incomparable descriptions of nature that abound in the british poets that have continued down from the flower and the leaf of chaucer and have brought into our closets all the freshness and fragrance of the dewy landscape the pastoral writers of other countries appear as if they have paid nature an occasional visit and become acquainted with her general charms but the british poets have lived and revelled with her they have wooed her in her most secret haunts they have watched her minutest caprices a spray could not tremble in the breeze a leaf could not rustle to the ground a diamond drop could not patter in the stream a fragrance could not exhale from the humble violet nor a daisy unfold its crimson tints to the morning but it has been noticed by these impassioned and delicate observers and wrought up into some beautiful morality the effect of this devotion of elegant minds to rural occupations has been wonderful on the face of the country a great part of the island is rather level and would be monotonous were it not for the charms of culture but it is studded and gemmed as it were with castles and palaces and embroidered with parks and gardens it does not abound in grand and sublime prospects but rather in little home scenes of rural repose and sheltered quiet every antique farmhouse and moss-grown cottage is a picture and as the roads are continually winding and the view is shut in by groves and hedges the eye is delighted by a continual succession of small landscapes of captivating loveliness the great charm however of english scenery is the moral feeling that seems to pervade it it is associated in the mind with ideas of order of quiet of sober well-established principles of hoary usage and reverend custom everything seems to be the growth of ages of regular and peaceful existence the old church of remote architecture with its low massive portal its gothic tower its windows rich with tracery and painted glass in scrupulous preservation its stately monuments of warriors and worthies of the olden time ancestors of the present lords of the soil its tombstones recording successive generations of sturdy yeomanry whose progeny still plough the same fields and kneel at the same altar the parsonage a quaint irregular pile partially antiquated but repaired and altered in the tastes of various ages and occupants the stile and footpath leading from the churchyard across pleasant fields and along shady hedgerows according to an immemorial right-of-way the neighbouring village with its venerable cottages its public green sheltered by trees under which the forefathers of the present race have sported the antique family mansion standing apart in some little rural domain but looking down with a protecting air 
on the surrounding scene. All these common features of English landscape evince a calm and sheltered security, a hereditary transmission of homebred virtues and local attachments that speak deeply and touchingly for the moral character of the nation. It is a pleasing sight of a Sunday morning when the bell is sending its sober melody across the quiet fields to behold the peasantry in their best finery with ruddy faces and modest cheerfulness thronging tranquilly along the green lanes to church but it is still more pleasing to see them in the evenings gathering about their cottage doors and appearing to exult in the humble comforts and embellishments which their own hands have spread around them it is this sweet home feeling this settled repose of affection in the domestic scene that is after all the parent of the steadiest virtues and purest enjoyments i cannot close these desultory remarks better than by quoting the words of a modern english poet who has depicted it with remarkable felicity through each gradation from the castled hall the city dome the villa crowned with shade but chief from modest mansions numberless in town or hamlet sheltering middle life down to the cottage val the straw-roofed shed this western isle has long been famed for scenes where bliss domestic finds a dwelling place domestic bliss that like a harmless dove honor and sweet endearment keeping guard can center in a little quiet nest all that desire would fly for through the earth that can the world eluding be itself a world enjoyed that wants no witness but its own sharers and approving heaven that like a flower deep hid in rock cleft smiles though tis only looking at the sky begin footnote from a poem on the death of the princess charlotte by the reverend ran kennedy a m end footnote end of rural life in england read by matt bonhoff